Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're now recording. So hello, my name is Sam Harlow and I am the UNCG Online Learning Librarian for UNCG University Libraries. UNCG Libraries came up with the idea to create a series of webinars for the UNCG community on research and applications, so welcome. In this series, different librarians and archivists will cover topics on UNCG Libraries resources and research tools. These 30-minute webinars will be recorded in WebEx meetings, where we are now, and placed on the library webpage through YouTube, where they will be eventually closed captioned and not have participant data available for the public. So I'm going to drop the page where all of our webinars live, including information about webinars. And uh, there it is in the chat. It will also contain other applicable links and presentation materials if needed. So I'm going to quickly cover some logistical things about how this webinar is going to run. Please mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio icon next to your name to turn it red, but feel free to turn your audio back on by clicking the audio icon again, uh, your mic icon, at the end of the webinar to participate in a conversation with the presenters. If you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate in the chat. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please put them in chat. Uh, there's a little chat icon at the bottom of your screen that you should see and then it shows up on your right. I will track questions in chat while the presenters uh, present the material. If there are technical issues, you can call me or email me and I'm going to drop that information in the chat and I'll guide you through some solutions. So as um, uh, and worst case scenario, this is being recorded. So are there any questions before I introduce the presenters? <coughs> Okay, so this session is being hosted by UNCG Special Collections and University Archives, also known as SCUA. Uh, Kathleen Smith, the Instruction and Outreach Archivist, and David Gwynn, our UNCG Library's Digital Project Coordinator, and they're presenting on digitizing and using primary sources. So um, are you guys ready, David and Kathleen? I believe so. Okay, I'm going to mute myself. Thank you. Great. Um, so yeah, um, I'm David. And I'm Kathleen. <laughs> um, and actually I'm in the Electronic Resources and Information Technology Department because I have to plug that on a regular basis just to make sure that we get full credit. Um, and we're going to talk today about digitizing and using primary sources. More really about using than digitizing, I think. But, um, so why would you want to digitize primary sources? I think we've pretty much all arrived at a consensus that it's a good thing to do that at this point. But um, the rationale behind digitization, uh, obviously number one, it's gonna be easier access to unique material, to obsolete formats, and to community material. So basically we're providing access to material that only we have or material that's in formats that we might have the only means of accessing those formats or NCG, which keeps people from uh, you know, having to make the physical trip to UNCG to see this material uh, and to use it. Um, also, it gives easier access to community material that may be not even housed in an archive, but housed in people's garages, their attics, et cetera. Uh, digitizing also tends to reduce stress on the original material, which helps to preserve it for the next round of users, um, particularly fragile materials like some photographs, glass plate negatives, scrapbooks, which we'll talk more about at a later point in this presentation, um, are very easily damaged by constant use, and digitization takes a lot of that stress off the items. Uh, we can also, when we digitize, do a value added for these items, making them in some ways maybe more accessible than they would be using the physical materials in the archives. For example, uh, we can take print materials like, for example, the Carolinians, Alumni News, et cetera, and OCR them here, you know, perform optical character recognition, which makes these documents full text searchable with some limitations. <laughs> Um, and also we can provide downloadable copies so that you have repeated access to the material. You don't, you can't just look at it the minute you're there touching it in the archives. Um, a big thing though that we think about digitizing primary source materials is it also increases awareness of archival materials in general. And that's a big thing that we try to, we try to stress with our digital collections is that the material that we digitize is not all there is, there's more. Um, and by, by making what we make available uh, 
accessible, we also introduce people to the concept of archives, and hopefully they realize that there's a lot more that they can see if they come in and visit us or check out finding aids online, for example. So who uses our digitized resources? Um, a lot of people actually, we have students, uh, even, even elementary and high school students are using our materials, and we've got a few projects going specifically with K-12 students. Uh, undergraduates, a lot, we'll talk a little more about the classroom component of some of our digital collections a little bit later on, as well as graduate students, faculty for research projects, digital humanities projects, Classroom use is a big one, and that's another area that we're trying to work with faculty members a lot on to get our materials into the classroom. But a big part of our user base is the general public. Uh, genealogists, particularly with some of our slavery-related materials, people doing build, building research, business research, um, all kinds of research. We've got maps, we've got pictures, we've got tons of stuff. Yeah. Um, and among our user base is also the odd, occasional Pulitzer Prize winning novelist here and there. Um, I mean that really. Uh, if you're familiar with this book, uh, The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, which won the, won the Pulitzer Prize last year, you'll notice in the acknowledgments that he used one of our digital collections in the, uh, in the uh, writing of the book. We were kind of proud about that. And so much so that we actually managed to get him here on campus at UNCG to speak. So. So let's talk a little bit about finding collections online, where you can find collections online, and I'm going to hand you to Kathleen. Okay, that. great. Thank you. Well, we were talking about kind of what our, our if we had to suggest several options for go-to online digital collections, um, these would be the ones we would probably uh, talk about first. One is the Digital Public Library of America. If you have not been on that site, please go there immediately. It's, it's really quite wonderful. And after the webinar. Yes, after the webinar, of course. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's really great because it gives, um, it kind of gives an opportunity for a researcher to look at material, uh, not only local material, but material from all over the United States. So basically, if you are part of this consortium, you digitize your material and it kind of gets slurped up into this, gr this great big database that's completely searchable. Um, we're going to actually go see that just in just a minute. The National Archives is a great resource. The Library of Congress has got wonderful things, so many things that are digitized. Um, and the Internet Archive, which is interesting too if you have not been on it, take a look because it's actually archiving um, different websites which is really convenient and, and very unique. There are also a lot of uh, user-contributed documents and content on the Internet Archive, which are uh, which make it very interesting, too. Now, unfortunately, that also makes the uh, metadata a little sketchy sometimes um, and sometimes makes things hard to find, but uh, dp.la. And this is a link. I'm trying to no, you're, that's, not, okay. that's not the right link. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Okay, so DPLA um, is it. It's wonderful, and again, it's completely searchable. You can also browse by topic. You can browse by partner. So, for example, you can see Greensboro is a partner. Um, so this, this basically lists the partners that have the greatest amount of digitized material in it. But we're actually there too. Um, exhibitions. So this is a, a great part of digitizing as well. You can pull together uh, digitized material from all kinds of repositories and put it together to make kind of one cohesive exhibit. And that's what they've done here. And this is, this is typical of a lot of sites that have digitized material. So these are separate exhibitions. Um, and this is really intriguing as well. And we definitely turn people toward these when we go out into the community and talk to K through 12 um, classrooms, um, teachers and social media specialists, because this, these are basically primary source sets uh, where they've already digitized material and pulled them together for primary source lessons. And this is just an example. And DPL does this, Library of Congress does this, National Archives um, also has these primary source sets on all different kinds of um, subjects. So teachers could just go in and browse and see if this would include anything that they would be teaching on and kind of grab it and it already has primary sources kind of um, sift out from other collections 
and it's a great way to use it. And it, again, it's just thoroughly searchable. It gives you, a, um, if you find something, for example, if you go to home, um, oh, there we go. And you search something, for example, Lincoln. And it shows you all kinds of images, text, correspondence. Um, if there's anything at all, a lot of photographs, it comes up and it also lists, but it also lists the repository. It, if you click on it, it has a complete metadata. Um, it's just it's just a great resource. So that's just one of the ones that we would once you get us back and um, suggest. But they're all really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go to the Digital Public Library of America. I think we said that already. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Honest, let's we we pretty much get it. There are these great websites, they're wonderful, we love them, we use them all the time as librarians, but we also recognize that people primarily come into digitized material through Google. We do too. Um, just for the record though, Google can be used a lot more effectively for finding digital digital collections than maybe uh, maybe most people do. Um, <laughs> There's a uh, rule of thumb among librarians that nobody ever uses the advanced search, but well, pretty much us. Um, but if you use the Google advanced search, you'll find a couple of very specific tools that will make it a lot easier to narrow down your search for digitized material or in research material in general. First up, you can restrict your search to a specific site or domain. So for example, uncg.edu or NYPL.org, if you wanted to limit yourself to the New York Public Library site, for example. You can also look for file type and usage rights on materials uh, where they're in a certain structured format. So, um, you know, Google, Google is good. We all use Google. Google is, is wonderful, but Google can be used a lot more effectively than a lot of people use it. And there are a lot of ways to narrow it down that you might not be quite as familiar with. So, Let's zoom in a little bit on how to use UNCG's digitized resources now. And obviously the first thing is that you have to find them. Um, a good way to start is the library's website, which makes sense if you think about it. So uh, using the library's website, which is library.uncg.edu, as you see on screen, um, once you go into the library's website, if you'll notice the two lovely stars on the left that uh, point to special collections in university archives and to NC docs and digitized collections. That kind of narrows you down and gets you into some of our digitized material. Um, the giant arrows are optional and probably will not show up on your device. So when you click on the special collections and university archives links, uh, you can go, as you might expect, to the special collections and university archives page. And um, this is going to get you both digitized material and online finding aids that will kind of guide you through your search a little bit. Um, so let's go in now to the UNCG library's website. And I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to do this live, so this is very screenshotty, but I don't think that's a big problem for this particular material. Notice your stars to the left. You can look at finding aids, subject research guides, or online collections. And one of the things we didn't start but should have is the library catalog. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, too. But right now, let's say, for example, that you clicked research guides or subject research guides. This is where you'd go. Please talk to us about uh, this. Thanks. Well, you're, you may be familiar with libraries um, lib guides or research guides. We've got wonderful ones um, on our library uh, web page, but we also have separate ones in the university archives, and this relates particularly to our collections. And uh, this is one for actually the Art Performing Arts Collection. And so it has everything from basic, you know, departmental overview to university archives material. So basically, it's just a shortcut for finding. Um, digitized material in the archives and actually non-digital digital material as well. Um, so it just separates us, uh, separates it within different collections in the university archives, like whether it's archives, whether it's manuscripts, rare books, uh, women vets projects, and it just kind of separates it like that. And then you see online collections. So that's specifically digitized. And we've digitized a lot of material in our archives. And um, so this is a kind of a fast and easy way to find it. And a curated way. Yes. 
And I'm finding it as well. This is this may be um, something that folks that are not as familiar with researching in an archive uh, may not be as familiar with, but finding aids is kind of a roadmap that archivists use to find uh, things within a collection, literally. And it's wonderful because you can find information, for example, this, this is for the Dr. Anna Maria Gove papers. Anna Maria Gove was our second campus physician. Um, she came in 1893 and she retired in, I believe, 1938. So if you, if you see a finding aid, it shows kind of a little bit of an overview of her collection, the major dates of the material within it. This starts in 1826, because actually it includes some of her family papers as well. Um, but the bulk of the collection is between 1890 and 1947. She actually created it. Um, and it gives you all kinds of different information, including citation information, um, how it was organized. And then it goes into a series and sub-series list and basically a box list. So you could quickly go through the, the boxes really online to see what you would need, which would which really takes a lot of uh, time and, um, and and worry when you can actually find out what box you need and what folder you need potentially before you even get to the archive. Um, so now let's look a little bit more at our uh, specific digital collections here. And we should notice at this point that not all our digitalized materials at UNCG actually come from special collections in the university archives. We work with a lot of local partners, local libraries, local museums as well to come up with our digital content. So on our website, um, which you see a nice link to right there, um, the Explore tab will give you some sort of broad subject areas. Most of our collections fall into these sort of five areas of UNCG history, Greensboro history, uh, manuscripts and special collections, which is sort of a mixed bag, uh, performing arts collections, and the Women Veterans Historical Project. Those are kind of the broad areas that you could uh, move to. But you can also explore by format, as you see down a little bit lower, where it says explore in all co collections. Um, there are a variety of options there. You can explore by date, by format, um, and by uh, topics, and also by which of our community partners may have contributed that item. There's also the advanced search. Yeah, my thing here is to push the advanced search over and over again. Um, advanced search, using the search box at the top of the page, again, um, it allows you to look for things within specific fields. So for example, if you wanted Abraham Lincoln, but you knew that you were looking for a book that had the name Abraham Lincoln in the title, you could limit your search to Abraham Lincoln in the title field, for example. You can also um, add and remove specific collections um, from your search. To be honest, this is not terribly intuitive. Right now, the way our digital collections look, we're in the process of a, a migration and a redesign that hopefully will make this whole search process an awful lot easier and more intuitive. Look for that about six months down the road, in theory. <laughs> so, when you get into these items, our digitized items, this is a lovely one from the Greensboro Public Library of the Woolworth Store downtown, which is now the International Civil Rights Museum, and a bunch of other buildings that aren't there anymore. Um, you're going to have some descriptions of the items and tell you a little more about it. For example, who created it, um, the format, just some actual, uh, possibly some biographical notes, some descriptions, some subject headings. Um, down at the bottom, you see the type and original photo format that'll tell you what, what the original item that we've digitized was, which is helpful. And frankly, if you think about it, that's the only way you're gonna be able to find these things because you know if you're looking for a picture of Woolworths, Unless there's some text on that page saying that you have a picture of Woolworths, you're not going to find it. So the metadata is very important. Right. So every time you have anything digitized, you're going to have someone creating metadata. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a helpful way of researching not only that item, but also linking it out to different subjects or different um, collections. Yeah. And it is a human being doing that. And to be honest, there are limits on time and resources, and every possible search term is not going to be included. Plus, you know, sometimes there are unanticipated uses. For example, a good one I, I stress is that um, I use pictures of parades a lot in research that I'm doing, not because I have any 
particular interest in parades, because I don't, but because they're also a great way to do building research to date what who was occupying a building at a certain time, for example, from those photos. So, you know, a lot of people are using our materials in ways that we can't even imagine and you can't really plan for with the metadata. But we, we try. Yes, we try. <laughs> um, you're also going to have some specifics on the source of the items. And with all our digitized collections, too, you're going to have a notice showing the copyright status and what you're allowed to do with it after you download our copy of it. Um, and that's a requirement of membership in the Digital Public Library of America. And I think a really good one, too, because a lot of digital collections sort of leave you hanging as to what the status of this material is and what you can do with it afterwards. Um, another related project is our Runway Slave Ads project. Uh, this is actually our most used digital collection of all, and that has a lot to do with the metadata that's associated with it. Um, this is going to be kind of small, and I apologize for that, but um, we've digitized and transcribed these Runaway Slave Ads from the 1700s going up into the Civil War. We've parsed out names, dates, newspapers. Uh, we have actually transcribed the articles. And the fact that we have such rich metadata on these particular ads is probably a big part of why it's our biggest or our most used collection. Because, you know, it's useful. People can find it. Um, and you can do an advanced search and drill down on people's names, et cetera. We're finding ways to integrate that also with the larger Digital Library of American Slavery, which brings together a lot of slavery-related records, too. And people have been using that to try to make connections between, say, census records or uh, slave deeds, court petitions, et cetera, and the ads to, to come up with genealogical resources that often aren't there for African Americans before about 1870 or so. Uh, we've used this in the classroom a lot, too, the, the Runaway Slave Ads Project. Uh, classroom use is a really big thing for us lately, getting our materials out of the archives and into the classrooms and into the curriculum. Now, for this particular project, the NC Runaway Slave Ads Project, we have students in history and uh, LIS classes working on it. Students were actually working with scanning, transcribing, and metadata creation. They also did projects based on the ads, uh, based on trends and items they found in the ad. And at the end of the semester, actually, LIS and history students side by side did presentations at the uh, history department symposium at the end of the semester. So I thought that was kind of a neat bit of integration between the two departments and uh, a good way to get this material into the classroom. And just more information about bringing um, this type of information into the classroom, as David mentioned. Um, just, a, just a few examples. Uh, for one of our classes, History 430, which was basically a historical methods class, we, uh, we did uh, kind of a, a pilot with our scrapbook. So they were promised earlier, we, we have a, a scrapbook story. So we have, we, have we do, we, ha we, uh, we had, uh, when push came to shove, we came up with 300, over, what, three, over 300 scrapbooks in the University Archives collection, not counting others in the manuscript and women veterans collection. And we basically digitized all of them within, what, three years, or most of them in three years, definitely all the archive ones. And shortened my life by about five years. Right, me too. And it was quite a project, but it was great because it gives us, uh, those scrapbooks and the information contained within it gave us um, really primary sources that we could have gotten nowhere else in the archive. And we, it was really wonderful for research. So we're talking about digitization, why it's important. Um, research is, is paramount. Uh, again, bringing collections together online um, that would not necessarily be together and also classroom use. So in this case, we actually gave these students um, the opportunity to look at the physical scrapbook, and then we got, gave them the opportunity to look at the scrapbook online. So they were assigned a scrapbook, and they could look at it both ways. They had times to come in to the archives, and then for the rest of the time, they looked at it online. This is a lib guide from that particular class. So um, it gave a list of primary sources, those that were digitized, those that were not, um, different you know, artifacts, photographs. We got a list of secondary sources and online resources as well. And of course, citations, because Citing information from archives is a little bit different. Okay, let's see. Okay, this is, these are just some interiors of some of these scrapbooks, and it gives you an idea of the kind of 
um, information that's inside of them. So it was, it was really interesting. I love the one on the left. That is um, one of the students. She was a uh, class of 1928, obviously a, a basketball player. And Lady Maud, actually Maud, um, was the uh, mascot for that particular literary society. She was a mule. And um, you see some interesting things too. That was another literary society mascot was the goat and the other one was the greasy pole. So a lot of kind of uh, information that you might have to have a little bit of knowledge about before you uh, kind of decipher it. But then others, for example, to the right, um, which kind of capture not only what was going on on campus, but also things that um, have historical significance within the town of Greensboro. Here you see um, the student has included um, a newspaper clipping of the landing of uh, and the visit visiting of Charles Lindbergh um, in Greensboro. And so that's great to see that kind of stuff too. We were hoping that that would happen more than it actually has. Uh, most of the students just uh, really kind of want to keep information that you see at that same page about the tacky party, which would be on Saturday night. But anyway, they give great resources and the students really loved this project and it gave them a chance to compare the physical item with the digitized item. We actually assessed this class and then at the end asked them um, kind of some feedback about how they like using the digital material and how they like using the physical material. Um, they really liked handling it too. It was not just the convenience of having it online. And this kind of goes with David and I always talk about really it's a place for both. And it really works well when you can use both the digital item and the physical item together. Yeah, I think a lot of people think we digitize things so that we can throw them away and that couldn't actually be further from the truth. Right, there really is a place for both. This is an example of, of uh, a student from that class. And to the right, you see that as a, you know, a content DM platform. Again, that we are about to move out of to Island Dora, but it's, it's gonna be basically the same type of display where you have a thumbnail of the object, um, a little bit of a description, kind of a thumbnail description, the the number of the item, the collection number of the item, what date it is, and then you can basically just click on it and have the whole scrapbook right at your fingertips. And uh, David and David's team did a really incredible job of uh, digitizing these scrapbooks, every little scrap, every letter that was folded up and put into um, uh, an envelope, and so digitization can be sometimes a very difficult project uh, that are that we're very lucky to have a wonderful digitization unit that was willing to take that on. Thank you. In some oh, cases, well. mildly disturbing too. <laughs> um, yeah, cat skulls. Mm -hmm. Let's not go there. Though. Just another quick example. Um, one other thing we use for uh, digitized material in the classroom is we teach a lot of courses that have a theme of civil rights because we have a rich civil rights history in Greensboro. Uh, of course, the sit-ins um, of February 1960 at the Woolworths downtown, and we actually had women co women, women's college students, which is women's college was what uh, UNCG was called before 1963, who participated in this. So it's great to bring this material um, to the classroom and talk about it. So digitize material from, um, let me click, from not only our collection, but other collections and uh, to really provide perspective on what happened. Uh, perspective of Gordon Blackwell, who was the chancellor of Women's College at the time, you see to the left, who gave a speech uh, eight days later about the sit in uh, when it was coming up with uh, all this information on in the newspapers, the community newspapers, the college newspapers. Curly Harris, who you see to the right, who was the manager of Woolworths at the time, information that he kept and on this um, event, and he was really writing about this for the rest of his life. Correspondence from both students and parents. So a lot of really great digitized material. And, uh, oh, and there are the oral histories. The so oral histories are also wonderful primary sources. We have a lot of those online as well, which offer perspectives about not only this event, but a lot of events that took place on the um, school campus. And all of these digitized materials, really not, I can't say all of them, but probably most of them from our repository and quite a few from neighboring repositories uh, can be accessed through Civil Rights Greensboro. This is one of those perfect situations where you can kind of gather a lot of digitized material and put it under one um, database and it's very searchable. So Civil Rights Greensboro, which UNCG hosts, can be searched by date, by format, by topic, for example, not only UNCG material is here, but also material from what, the library, um, the museum, the Greensboro Museum. We've got material that reflects Bennett, what A and T, um, but Duke. yeah, Duke. <laughs> um, a bunch of different materials, all digitized, 
and very searchable under this one website. So this is a great resource and we always bring this into the classroom. So some final thoughts um, about digitization, um, pro and con. Well, actually we're all pro digitization, but with some caveats. I think the first one we mentioned earlier on is the context. The fact that there is a digital collection online does not necessarily always mean that it is completely online or that any other material that's related to it is online. Right, and we see that a lot with students. They think that if they found, you know, a couple of things that are digitized, that's absolutely all there is out there. And we always try to mention that because I think that's one of the, the big the big drawbacks about researching digital material. Particularly with a, with a, curate, a very curated collection like Civil Rights Greensboro, where actually we chose specific items for the theme. We weren't digitizing complete collections. Um, in some cases, we may have had two or three items out of a collection that had 10,000 items. Um, and you know, people, it, it's, it's hard to provide that context just to make sure that people understand that, yeah, there's more. Right, it's good for a certain type of online research, but not you know, complete online. Yeah. Um, and I tell people in my, in classes that I teach, my student workers, everybody, it's all about the metadata. And some metadata is better than other metadata. Of course, all our metadata here at UNCG is perfect and there are no problems <laughs> with it. That and it's sense. completely appropriate to the items that we're describing. Other places, that's not always the case. Okay, it's not always the case for us either. I was lying. but. Um, Understanding that the metadata is what makes the items discoverable, and if there's a problem with that, then, well, there's a problem. Kathleen mentioned, what about citations? Would you like to talk more about citations? Well, in the sense that they're, they're usually, I mean, they're, they're specific and they're a little bit different from citing different, um, you know, more physical items, and sometimes researchers and students especially are not really used to citing digital information or primary source information either. So uh, hopefully that kind of material will be included in the metadata, but not always. Yeah, um, yeah we do try to, to, uh, to make it clear what collection mm -hmm. and what repository each item came from. Not everybody notices that, <laughs> but, um, but we try. Um, evolving digital platforms is a big thing that actually Kathleen and I are both dealing with right now, uh, the archives is moving to a new system to present their finding aids and we are moving to a new platform for all our digital collections too um, which hopefully will make them more accessible but on the other hand it's always change and change always causes problems for people uh, change is not always either bad or good but it always brings up issues and this is going to continue to be the case because the digital platforms are going to advance or change over the years uh, what happens with collections that are left behind and might not be as easily usable or discoverable as newer collections um, or collections that have been migrated to newer platforms. That's always going to be an issue for researchers using digital collections because you know, there might not be money to necessarily upgrade to well, the latest standard. Exactly. So, my, you know, anything from digitization, migration, anything like that takes staff time and institutional money. And so it is, it, it is sometimes a lot more involved than you would think. And that's why we've been, at our university, we've been great about getting bank grants and stuff like that that has gone out in community and allowed um, digitization to happen kind of on, on our dime or on the grants dime, which I think yeah. is important because it, this does take a, a lot of staff time and, and it's, it's costly. It can be costly. The issue with the you know, grant funded problems is that it's often, it's very sexy to create new content with a grant, but to maintain old content with a grant, not so much. It's sort of like, you know, it's hard to get government money to repay the roads or fix the trains. Um, we are looking at a lot of new approaches for digital collections too. Uh, specifically, I think the, the one that excites me the most right now is community collections, whereby we are not necessarily digitizing items that we own or hold a physical copy of. That could be that members of the community have contributed digital resources or that they have let us scan materials uh, and otherwise digitize them and then they took them back so that people didn't have to give up their materials or contribute or donate it so that we'd still then be able to share it with uh, external audiences. Mm -hmm. I think that's a uh, 
a big thing for us now. I think it's reveal it's making a lot more materials accessible to people, but it also creates some problems because I think there's an expectation among some users that well, it's on your website, so you we must have the lot. physical copy, right? Yes, we get that a lot. <laughs> so, and that's clearly not always the case. So uh, that's some things we're, yeah, we're thinking about and that you should probably think about is using digitized resources for research. Any other thoughts okay. from you? Okay, well, we're open for questions if you have any, or... You can contact us later. Great. So, um... This is the time for questions. So as you guys are wrapping up, I put some information in the chat. So um, this is the last for the research and application webinar series for spring 2019. Uh, but be on the lookout for fall ones. We don't typically do them in the summer. Um, and then we have one more left for the online learning series on uh, library tutorials. So uh, be on the lookout for emails about that from your liaison as well. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself or put them in the chat. Or if you'd rather, you can contact us later. Contact us later, too. We're open. We are platform neutral here. So Hannah says, off this topic, can you post the link to the SAGE research? Yes. Um, yes. I, it's on the webinar series page. So um, I will link here, um, that's here, and then uh, here's the YouTube video. I will put it in the chat as well. Great. Does anyone else have any uh, questions or requests? I was a DJ. I do take requests. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so um, again, the information for the next one's in the chat. You guys see uh, Kathleen and David's uh, email addresses. I will link to this presentation, if Kathleen and David don't mind, in the um, LibGuide so that you will see all these links so you don't have to download the chat. I was putting the links in the chat as you guys were going, uh, David and Kathleen, just so that you know. And uh, yeah, anything else before I close the meeting? Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. We'll see you soon. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye. Bye.